sort of um, one of our last uh, topics that we're going to cover for this course and the rest will just be sort of project based. Uh, I might have uh, you guys do one more uh, improvement of your code uh, kind of assignment uh, later on. Uh, there's already one online already um, and in, in both in both of the available um, uh, coding programs that are whose due date is not yet passed as of today uh, and today is August August today is April the uh, 21st so as of April 21st there's still two assignments whose due date is not passed and you would be allowed to use functions and methods in both of them um, so uh, and by the way if you're in the college uh, course that would be optional so we've seen and used functions and methods already and you can see that we have uh, things like str2.charat so if we have a string called str2 uh, we can access a particular character inside a string by passing a parameter n into the uh, method char at actually function the function char at and what the function returns is the char at that position so let's say you have the a word like well a word like word w o r d so if i um if i wanted to pass the number two in there then counting from zero zero one two i get you count w o r so this function will return the letter R. And what it returns is of type char, not of type string. Math.pow is just x to the power n. x and n could be any number, any, any data type at all uh, in terms of numbers. So it can be integer, it can be float, it can be double, whatever. Math.pi is only a constant it doesn't take any arguments. It has no it has no brackets in front of it. And so it's not really thought of as an actual function. It's just a number that's stored as a constant. And here we have math.random, which has brackets inside it, but there's nothing in between those brackets. Math.random does not take a parameter. It does not take arguments at all. It just generates a random number. And the kind of number it generates is a number between 0 and 1. If you want a substring, uh, let's say you have a substring like um, computer. Okay, so you have the word computer and you want to pass the numbers m equals 0 and n equals 3. So from 0 to 3, you're counting 0, remember, is the first character. You have C-O-M-P. So 0, 1, 2, 3. So COMP would be your substring, and um, that's the substring that would be returned. So what this data type, uh, the data type of this function would return a string. Okay. Uh, system out print line, you notice, you notice that you pass a literal string in there. You can also pass a string variable in there or even any other kind of variable. And what print line does is it sends output to the console. It doesn't really return a number. It doesn't really return values. It just sends output to the console. So that's a that's a method, okay? And uh, so methods tend to do things while functions tend to calculate things. Um, okay. Uh. So what you have here is um, uh, some of some of these functions take parameters like char at takes the parameter n and n is just a whole number it's an integer and a positive whole number you can't have a negative number passed into char at math.pow x and n can be any number um, but x and n cannot both be zero and then you have parameters passed into the function called substring, which returns a string, and both m and n are integer. 
System out print line takes a parameter hello, and that gets passed into the function, the method print line. It's not really a function because it doesn't return a value, but what it does is it sends the word hello out to the console. Okay, so basically um, you can you can also have um, some of the functions that are available in Java can take multiple parameters and um, and sometimes even variable parameters like for example system.out.printf takes a string followed by God knows what data types and God knows how many. There could be a lot of different data types and a lot of different parameters or it could be just two parameters the string and the variable of whatever data type is appropriate. Now uh, let's talk about one of the methods we use the most often and one of the methods which we write the most often as programmers in Java and that is the main method. So you have a class declared called main and it takes, uh, you can see here, that class called main is not really the method, that's a class, that's like an object being declared. The method we're referring to begins on line two, public static void main, and it notice it's declared with a parameter list. Well, it's only one parameter really, args, which is an array of string over here. And notice inside it, we do some, we do some things like generate a random number and put the result in value. And then, excuse me, then on line four we print it out. Now to, uh, if you want more detail on math.random, go to the Google Doc, a summary of Java's math functions, because that will give you a lot more detail about that. Um, what we have here, this main routine, really is more appropriately referred to as a subprogram, especially when you start writing other subprograms, once you start making functions and procedures and so on. So let's move on. A function which simulates a dice roll. So in the last slide, notice the dice roll was done entirely in line three. Math.random gives a number between zero and one. To be honest with you, it gives a number exactly equal, well, gives a number between zero, including zero, but up to, but not including one. Okay? Not including one. So that means you don't get to be quite one. The highest this random thing can generate is something like 0 0.999999 whatever. And so if we have a number from zero to almost one, when we go here and multiply by six, well, the lowest number we can have is zero. So zero times six is still zero. And this number that's almost one, when you multiply it by six, is almost six. Not exactly six. This is important. Because when we cast the result as integer, we chop the decimal. That means if you end up with 5.999999, those decimals are gone. You just get five, okay? Int returns the integer portion of a floating point. That's how the casting is done. It just chops the decimal off. It does not round. So we get a number. The lowest we can get is a zero. The highest we can get is a five. That's not very good for a dice roll, but one advantage is that it has zero, one, two, three, four, five, meaning six different values, right? We have six different values here, all right? All right, so then when we add one, the one at the end bumps everything up. So the lowest was zero, but when you add one, the lowest is now one. The highest was five, but then when you add one, the highest will be six. So we shift the range up by one of this function from zero to five up, for, up to one through six. And then 
whatever number we generate, either one, two, three, four, five, or six for our dice roll, gets put in this integer variable called value. And then we print it in line four. We print it out to the console. So now over here, we took, we took this generation, this kind of cumbersome looking code in line three, and we moved it to its own function called dice roll. We just called the function dice roll. And it pretty much is the same formula. It gets put into an integer variable and that gets returned. Notice that the function consists of a declaration, public static int, and then the name of the function. Well, that int is pretty important because that tells you what data type that function returns. And you can see here clearly it is going to return integer. It's going to return a whole number. So you go int roll equals, and then it does this thing with the random generation of the numbers one through six. Those One of those numbers that's generated goes into roll, and that number is returned. Let's say, let's say this random generation gives us the number three, then roll equals three, roll becomes three. And then the function returns in line nine, the number three. It returns the number three and where does it go? Well, it goes to line three over here where dice roll becomes the number three. And that three is assigned to the variable value also in line three. And then in line four, that number three is printed out. That's really what's going on here. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to see how we can make a dice roll uh, into a function. So we just did, we just did that. And um, so the idea is the main difference between a function and a method. I said main was a method and I said without a doubt, dice roll is a function. Well, how is main a method and how is dice roll a function? Dice roll is a function because it returns a value and it's clear in line seven what kind of value it returns. It's an int. So if it states a data type in the declaration, you know that it's a function. It will return a variable of the type that's in the declaration. Here, it will return a type of integer. Up in line two, where main is declared, in the declaration, we see the word void, which means, what void means is that this routine, this subprogram returns nothing. It doesn't return anything. It doesn't have a return value. It doesn't come out back into the operating system with some kind of a number. You know, there are some programs that do that. There are some programs that run, say, in Unix, in a Unix operating system, which return a value, and that value goes to the kernel. Either, uh, either it's uh, it the program executed successfully, or it. It ended execution with error. Um, but these Java programs don't do that. Um, they simply just they simply just go. <laughs> um, they, they actually, after main finishes executing, the program just exits from memory, and that's all you know about it. So uh, now over here, we have s still a program that as a little more sophisticated than it was. It still only does one dice roll, right? You run this program, you do a dice roll, and if you want another one, you have to run the program all over again. Well, what if you wanted a whole series of dice rolls? So this next code actually has generates 10 dice rolls. We're going from zero to less than 10, really, from zero to nine. And as we loop around, this, these statements inside the for loop will execute 10 times. We set up a, um, we set up an integer variable called value, and that value gets the value of the dice roll. Once again, this, um, this formula on the third last line of this illustration uh, sends a value to the return statement. Notice this isn't put in a variable, which is kind of strange, but in saving space, you can, it's perfectly reasonable 
to have the formula just go directly to the return statement. And so what happens when it returns whatever value is randomly generated? It goes into this variable dice roll. And whatever that number is gets assigned a value. And then in the next line it gets printed. This happens 10 times. So once, once this value gets printed, it goes to the for loop and sees if it can still execute. It increments i by 1 and then checks to see if it's less than 10. And if it is, then we do another dice roll and we print its value out once more. Um, and that, was, that would require a call to this dice roll uh, function. OK. So uh, one other thing about this program is we could also form a method. And this method would consist of this for loop and even the integer uh, declaration as well. We can take all that and place uh, that entire for loop and that integer declaration into its own subroutine or its own method. And um, in some languages they call it a procedure. And over here we have do dice rolls, int num. So you basically notice that we call do dice rolls in main and look how wonderful this is. The main routine only has exactly one line. Um, that's just amazing, right? It's you, you've gotten rid of all the complexity and all the complex, complicated junk is actually sent into the functions and subroutines. So do dice rolls is a um, is a uh, subroutine. It's a, a method. And that's because it is declared with data type of void, right? It doesn't return anything. It just does something. And in fact, it rolls the dice 10 times. And it rolls the dice 10 times by calling the dice roll function, which as you notice, I went back to um, uh, putting the formula in a separate line from the return statement. Um, and you, you, know, you could sort of go in between doing it one way or the other. OK, so um, here's another thing, too. We have, um, I know some people have had problems with uh, managing their variables. And sometimes when you run into problems with uh, variable declarations or the use of a variable, um, sometimes it's outside, you're, declare, you're making a declaration inside a set of brackets. And I, what I mean are those curly braces. But then you use the variable at some point outside of those curly braces and Java gives you an error because it's not in scope. So it doesn't even know what the hell that variable is, it doesn't even recognize it, okay? Um, so that's actually like this word value here. Notice I declare this value, this value variable as an integer, but look what I do in line 15. I have another identical declaration of value as integer. Java is quite happy with this. It's quite happy doing it like this. And that's because this declaration of value on line 7 and this declaration of value in line 15 are both out of scope with respect to each other, so they're not going to interfere. They have nothing to do with each other. If I declared value only once up here and didn't declare it here and just had value equals instead of int value, I just had value equals, then the program would crash because it wouldn't know what this variable is. So you have to watch out for that. So uh, if a variable is out of scope, that's a problem. But if the declaration is done each time it's out of scope, then, hey, that's no problem. In fact, it actually saves you a little bit of trouble in trying to always make up a a different name describing the same kind of variable in a different part of the program. It's really, really kind of, uh, it, it's, it's actually more convenient than anything to allow you to uh, declare the same variable name and this is all perfectly fine. Uh, and, you know, so we take it, really we should look at this out of scope issue as a positive thing, not as a negative thing. It's a positive thing because we don't have to keep making up new variable names to describe the same 
kind of variable in a different part of the code that would normally be out of scope. Okay, so here's something else. Um, we also discuss the call stack uh, in when we're discussing functions because you're going to be using functions and at some point in your computer science education you might run into problems where you know you have a stack dump uh, and that that's true in some operating systems like a unix operating system that's also true on the command line if you're uh, doing c coding um, you could have things like a stack dump and it'll actually say that uh, in the error in the error message and a stack dump just means that it's calling a bunch of routines and it's calling them several times but all of a sudden it just it just gets all too much and basically the program gives up and returns you to the operating system that's the best case scenario it could also be that it just made your operating system very unstable and then a whole bunch of uh, programs are freezing in an odd way so um, that's basically that and notice that we're calling do dice rolls with 10 so main is there running it's basically in order to have a running program you got to have main there so main calls dice rolls main is still running dice rolls then gets called now dice rolls is running dice rolls is doing stuff main is down here it's kind of hibernating um, if di if main had any variables declared you know it's as if they wouldn't exist basically we we're not aware of the variables. So the only thing the only pr part of the program doing any action is the call to do dice rolls but what does do dice rolls do well it calls it actually tries to roll the dice so it goes it calls dice roll in line 14 so we have now a third function added to the stack this is not a big deal we have plenty of memory uh, computers nowadays have tons of memory this is not not even close to being an issue so but that's what the call stack is you have main on the bottom and then anything that it, that main calls and anything called by secondarily by other other sub programs gets stacked on top kind of like stacking coins you know uh, it's usually when you stack coins you place coins one on top of the other and that's how we often think of uh, pushing um, new calls to new functions onto a stack so putting putting new uh, function or procedure calls in a call stack is called a push operation whereas if if that let's say dice roll does its thing it rolls the dice and it gives a value and it returns it well then it has nothing else to do so dice roll gets popped from the stack meaning that that disappears and what's left is the value the return value that dice roll returned and it returns it to line nine and then that number gets assigned to the variable value and then in line 10 it gets printed out and then i gets incremented by one and if i is less than num we do it again okay we just keep doing this so then uh, we can have many calls to dice rolls so the next call to dice roll pushes dice roll once again on the stack and when dice roll actually uh, generates a value it returns that to the calling function and so we have basically uh, dice roll just uh, being called returning a value and then um, being called again returning a value and then getting popped and then called again and returning a value and getting popped and so on uh, meanwhile while um, what any program that is below whatever it is is on top of the stack all those sub programs below are in a state of hibernation they're not really doing anything they're waiting really they're they're in a state of waiting for the function to return from its call and once it returns from its call the function just gets popped and the same is true for procedures 
once do dice roll reaches 10, well, 10 is less than 10. Well, I'm, we're calling it with the number 10. So this upper limit is 10. So once i is 10, 10 cannot be less than 10. So this function, or sorry, this procedure exits. We have nothing else after the for statement. So this do dice rolls just exits. And underneath is the main function. And you can see main only consists of one statement. So it too exits because there's nothing else for it to do. And so basically it just returns to the operating system. So then uh, diagrammatically, these sorts of things can be expressed diagrammatically. These next two slides are pretty much explaining everything I just said. Uh, you can actually peruse these for yourself. But basically, when the program starts, we load main. When um, it calls do dice roll, do dice roll gets pushed onto the stack. When do dice roll calls dice roll, um, it dice roll gets pushed onto the stack. And then once dice roll returns a value, it gets popped. And once do dice roll um, finishes its 10 dice rolls or finishes its num number of dice rolls, it also gets popped from the stack, leaving main. And main, finding nothing better to do, also gets popped. And you're returned back to the operating system. So um, that, that function then stops execution, or the program stops execution. So this is basically the end of this part of the video. Uh, there will be another part. Um, I'm going to have a part two for the... Um, a part two for the idea of recursion. That's a whole other concept, but it uses functions or and or procedures or methods, if you like. Meanwhile, you can check your understanding by writing a little subprogram. How about modifying one of my programs that were demonstrated so far in the slideshow, modifying them so that A, they accept N dice rolls and n sided dice well they both can't be n maybe one is n and the other is m or something okay so you have maybe a dice roll with n sides and the number of repeats set to some arbitrary number like m or maybe we can just use num because we're using it already um so but that means that the user what 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 i'm suggesting here is that the user sets those numbers, not the programmer. So now you're asking for input from the user, and then you're getting um, you're getting um, a dice with arbitrary sides, arbitrary number of sides run an arbitrary number of times based on whatever the user wants. Um, there are such a thing as a dice with more than one side. Uh, if you have ever been to a gaming shop. Uh, you might have noticed that you have dice with four sides here, six sides, eight sides, 12 sides, and 20 sides. And these two up above have 10 sides each. And so these gaming dice are quite common in uh, role-playing games and so on. Uh, and down here, down below, there's these kind of um, amusement sort of dice because they don't really have any practical purpose. They're 120 side dice. Um, and some designer dis decided that, oh, gee, what's the most sides you can have on a die and it still be a fair die? Well, it turns out 120 is the number. And I'm told that these are notoriously difficult to manufacture. Uh, then, uh, so after that, we're just going to do recursion. So we're going to uh, pause the, stop the video for now. You can think about this rolling a die with n sides thing, but also don't forget, it's the end user that's going to determine how many sides the dice is. It's going to be decided at runtime. Also, the number of repetitions, which is not mentioned here, the number of repetitions the number of repeated dice rolls, how many repetitions does it do? That's also going to be um, that's also going to be determined by the user. So uh, it's quite 
you know, quite an amusing thing to try to think about.